I have a question for you. How do you view disabled people? Well, we're portrayed in lots of different ways. We're portrayed as um, passive recipients of charity, as objects of pity, sometimes as work-shy benefit scroungers, and at other times, heroes, Paralympians. But as leaders of an organization that affects the lives of millions of people, how do you view disabled people? Well, I'm one. And like all of us in this room, I have lots of aspects that make me up to be who, the person I am. So I'm a woman, I'm white, um, I'm a mother, I'm a very proud grandmother, have been for six months, um, and, um, and I'm disabled. And being disabled doesn't define who I am, but it does impact on pretty much everything I do, a bit like all those other characteristics do. My particular disability affects my spine, so it's difficult for me to sit. It's a ridiculous disability to have. So I spend my working life either lying down, oh, these are just going ahead whether I want them to or not by the looks of it. I spend my life um, lying down uh, using my computer um, or standing up at events like this. And the work that I do as a social entrepreneur is to help inclusive employers attract more disabled candidates. And we only employ disabled people ourselves. We're quite small, there's only nine of us, but we're disabled, so we make up about 18. And um, I spend quite a bit of my time talking to employers about diversity. And I think probably about 15 years ago, if I'd have talked to employers about diversity, they would have said, well, it doesn't really, it's not really relevant to us. Diversity, what's that all about? But now it's different. When I talk to employers about diversity, their eyes light up a little bit and they say, oh, we've got all these programs on race, or they'll have to say as I look around this audience, not sure how that's working here, um, and we have these programs to get women into boardroom positions. And if I'm really lucky, they might tell me about what they're doing about sexual orientation and um, LGBT+. And according to the photograph that I found on stock photographs, apparently you have to have very white teeth in order to be diverse. I'm not sure I qualify. So when I say to them, that's great, I'm really glad you're doing all of those things, that's really good to hear. What are you doing around disability? The whole tone of voice changes. Oh, disabled people, you know, it's really a shame. We really ought to do more about disabled people, but, you know, and then I interrupt and I say, no, no, I'm talking about employing disabled people, having disabled talent within your workforce. What about that? Tone of voice changes again. Um, no, 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 you see, disabled people, they're not very productive. They're not gonna have many skills, are they? They're always gonna be off sick and um, expensive adaptations they're going to need. And they're gonna be a health and safety risk, aren't they? Blind people bumping into things, deaf people not hearing the fire alarms. Um, you know, we're gonna trip up over all the wheelchairs. They're just gonna be a health and safety risk. So really, employing disabled people it sounds really good, but it's a hell of an expensive risk, isn't it? But I say, what happens if we start thinking about disabled people differently? What happens if we think about talent? And when I talk to employers, another thing they say is, we're really worried about skill shortages. Wherever we go, we can't find the skills that we need. We've got gaps in our organization. And my answer is, I don't think there is a skills gap. I just don't think we're looking in the right place. And um, if you think about disabled people, we form about 20% of working age people. If you're excluding 20%, that's one in five of the talented people that might want for you to work for your organization, then that's an enormous amount of talent that you might be missing out on. Sickness absence can be huge, particularly in public sector organizations. Maybe surprisingly, disabled people actually have significantly less time off sick than our non-disabled colleagues. That might sound a bit counterintuitive, but if you think about it, someone who's an amputee or who's blind is no more likely to have colds or um, flu or anything that, than anybody else. But also, most of us who are disabled will be battling with symptoms or maybe um, side effects from drugs as we go through our lives every day. So we're quite used to going to work under pressure. And if we have a bit of a sniffle or a headache, we're not going to phone in sick. So actually, there is significantly less sickness absence from disabled um, people. The health and safety thing, actually, again, disabled people have fewer workplace accidents than our non-disabled colleagues. 
And again, that might be surprising, but uh, if you take me as an example, I have um, a neck that's pretty fragile. So if I fall, I could do some pretty awful permanent damage to myself. I'm going to make damn sure I don't fall. I've even mastered the art of staying upright after the odd two or three bottles of, uh, of wine, although there is that one very embarrassing incident which I won't mention today. Um, so we tend to be very careful um, and we don't have accidents. It's already been mentioned by other speakers today, but it's really important for organizations to reflect the people that they serve. And that's for two reasons, really. You serve the people of Wales. If they're going to have confidence in you as an organization, they need to look at you and see people like themselves and think, they understand me. They know what I need. They're going to look after me. They're going to do things that I need. But also, if 20% of the people that your organization serves are disabled, how are you going to have that internal intelligence to know what to do to serve disabled people in your communities? Well, if you have disabled people within your organization, you have a rich source of internal intelligence about disability. And the most, I think, effective way to learn about people who are different is to work alongside them. You know, you can read books, you can watch TED Talks, but actually if you walk, work alongside people who are different from you, that's really how you learn. And if an organization has disabled people working within it, that difference stops becoming frightening and a bit worrying, and what do we say and what do we do? It just becomes another difference that we share um, and that we deal with. Also, disabled people stay longer in our jobs. Um, sometimes for the wrong reasons. It might be because we can't find jobs anywhere else or we're frightened to leave. But what you will find is that if you d employ disabled people and look after them and value them and help them to thrive, they're not going to want to work anywhere else. They're going to be happy staying with you. And there is lots of evidence that uh, talks about improved retention amongst disabled um, employees. And of course, we do bring additional skills with us. Every day, by the very definition of being disabled, we are having to overcome barriers and obstacles that everybody else just takes for granted. And we have to develop problem-solving skills. We have to develop creativity. We have to develop innovation. We need to plan things. I can't just come to Cardiff from London without having to plan how am I going to get there. I don't sit. It's difficult to use a train. Um, so we have additional skills around project management, around innovative thinking, about problem solving. We have to be determined and persistent. And don't we want to work with people who don't just run away at the first sign of a problem, that will actually keep looking and finding different ways to solve that problem in innovative ways, rather than just running away at the first sign of something not going quite right. And of course, some disabled people bring additional skills because of their impairments, rather than despite them. So it's a very broad generalization, but we, we heard earlier on about how neurodiverse people think differently and can challenge groupthink. And groupthink is a huge barrier to innovation and new ideas and moving forward and changing with the times. So often we'll bring things with us because of our impairments, not despite our impairments. And what we find also is that organizations who look after their disabled people have raised morale amongst everybody in the organization, disabled or otherwise. 2% of people of working age become disabled or acquire a long-term health condition every year. So if your organization, people within it can see that if something happens to me, I'm still going to be valued, I'm still going to be looked after, I'm still going to be able to progress within this organization, the morale goes up throughout the whole organization, not just for disabled people. So I've just mentioned a few benefits here. If an organization takes these on board, you become an employer of choice. And being an employer of choice means that you are always going to attract the very best talent, whether that's disabled or otherwise. I have two daughters who are millennials. And people of my daughter's age, when they look for work, they're not just looking for the best salary. They're not just looking for the, the most amount of annual leave. They're also looking to see if their prospective employer has a social conscience, looks after its staff, has a social impact on the area around it, and that will really make a difference to whether they want to have a job with you or not. So doing all of these things is really good for your organization. So I hope what I've done is begin to tell you a little bit about why employee disabled people, why it should be good for you. 
And of course, the lesson there is that actually, it's not just that there's nothing wrong with disabled people, it's that we make really good employees. So if there's nothing wrong with us, what's going wrong then? So this is what we call the social model of disability. You may well have come across it before. The social model is um, different from what used to be the medical model. The medical model would say, the problem is the disabled person. The way to fix the problem is to change the disabled person so they become more normal, whatever normal is, and who wants to be normal anyway? Lots of disabled people can't be made normal any more than anybody else can be made different from who they are. So the problem doesn't lie with the disabled person, it lies with the environment that we live in. So in this crude analogy, the problem isn't the wheelchair, the problem is the stairs. If everywhere had flat access, step-free access, people who use wheelchairs wouldn't be disabled. They'd be able to get to the same places that you get to. If we all knew how to do sign language, deaf people wouldn't be disabled because they'd be able to converse with people in the same way that you do. Um, if all of our websites were accessible, they wouldn't exclude many disabled people who can't use technology, for example. And when we're talking about employment, the problem isn't the autistic candidate, the problem is the recruitment process that insists on an interview, even though we know that interviewers are a very poor predictor of future performance for anybody, let alone somebody with autism. So the social model has implications for all of us who are involved in employment and in service delivery. I'm quite happy with the medical model in as much as I'm quite happy for the doctors and the medics and the scientists to continue to look for ways of helping symptoms. My biggest symptom is chronic pain. I would love for them to find a pain relieving something that doesn't have horrific side effects. That would be great. But I'm not a scientist. And as far as I know, most of us in here aren't in the medical industry. So let's leave that bit to them. And for the rest of us, let's look at the barriers that are there and remove the barriers, because that's what's really going to able people, enable people to do their work. So what implications does this have for you as inclusive leaders? It has a huge impact on you. And all the speakers so far today, and I'm pretty certain all the speakers and the rest of the day, are going to be saying that actually creating an inclusive culture is down to really good inclusive leadership. So what is inclusive leadership? Well, really, it's just good leadership. It's nothing kind of rocket science about it. It's just doing all the things that good leaders do. Again, we've heard about that earlier on today. It means creating an inclusive, open culture and environment where people can thrive. So what does that mean on a practical level? As a leader, it's important that you model inclusive behavior. Now, that could be the kind of banter you use, the kind of language you use, the way you treat the people who work with you, the way you ask for help, as we saw in the previous video, um, actually showing people this is how inclusive behavior looks. And I'm going to model it, and I'm going to expect people that I manage and I lead to have that kind of behavior as well. It's about being prepared to have those difficult conversations about difference. One of the biggest things about being a role model for a leader is to actually expose your vulnerability. We did some filming some years ago and, um, about an employer who was talking about the benefits of employing disabled people because I felt it would be better coming from them than coming from me because, of course, I would say that. Mainstream employer. On the day of the filming, that mainstream employer, very senior partner in a very large firm, decided to be open about their mental health on film. Never mentioned it before. They talked about the fact they'd been hospitalized. It was clearly some serious mental health issue. They didn't go into details. What happened after that was that other people within that organization could look up and say, hang on, he's a senior partner, and he's been hospitalized for mental health. So if I talk about my mental health, it won't disadvantage me. I can speak to my manager and say, actually, I'm really struggling at the moment. And then things can be put in place before that person reaches a crisis. The whole organization benefits just from that one person deciding to be brave enough to say, actually, this is my story. And why should we be any more brave about talking about mental health than we would be about talking about flu or a broken leg or a stomach bug or whatever it might be? 
So enable those conversations to happen by showing your own vulnerability and by showing that interest in other people so that the conversations that you have become every day. It's not just once a year at an annual appraisal that you'll say to somebody, are we meeting your access needs? It needs to be discussed all the time so that it doesn't become the elephant in the room, so that people can talk about these issues without it being difficult or strange or awkward. It just becomes another conversation like you might talk about the weather. The other thing as leaders, really, it's about enabling people to identify their strengths and then thrive by using those strengths and growing those strengths. And if we focus on somebody's disability, what we forget to do is look about all of their ability. And I can tell you the candidates that I work with, their abilities are breathtaking quite often. So look for people's strengths and help them to grow those strengths and develop them and use them wisely in the workplace. Also, make sure that you take effort to identify any barriers that there might be in the organization. That could be in the recruitment process, it could be in other HR policies, it could be in management style, it could be in accessible buildings, it could be all sorts of things. And it's important to look for those barriers so that you can find them and remove them. And you don't have to do this on your own because you'll have a disabled workers group. I can't remember what it's called, but I know you have one a network for disabled employees, and they will tell you. They will tell you what the barriers are. Listen to them, ask them, and they will tell you, and then you can start to address those barriers and start removing them. Another thing that can work well is reverse mentoring. So if you do have disabled people working within your organization, you can learn from them as leaders. You can learn what their journey is like, what they've had to go through, what they face every day in this organization, and you can upskill your own knowledge on those particular issues. And inclusion needs to be mainstreamed. It needs to be right at the center of everything that you do as a leader, not a bolt-on extra that you think about every now and again after you've had a TED talk about inclusion, but actually part of your everyday life, part of your performance management, part of the way you manage people, part of the way you communicate with people, and part of the way you manage your budgets. I will have really interesting conversations with all sorts of industry leaders, and they will say, no, Jane, actually, we're really serious about this. This is a really high priority for us. And I say, oh, that's great to hear. You know, you could do this, and you could do, ah, oh, oh, we don't have a budget. And then I have to question, you know, if this is really important to you, you'd find the budget from somewhere. So this isn't just a kind of, well, we'll do it if it doesn't actually mean we have to change anything or spend any money. This is something that's really worth investing in. So I hope that now, when I ask you how you view disabled people, that you won't see us as an expensive problem, that you'll see us as a valuable asset that needs to be nurtured and that can thrive in your organization. So my parting message to you is please be more inclusive in your everyday leadership, and remember that disability is more about talent than about pity. Thank you. <laughs>